when I get a call from Tom or I call him, I always start with where are you? What time zone are you in? What state are you in? He literally goes to places where angels fear to tread. Downtown Portland, downtown Seattle, downtown Bakersfield. I've seen him participate in his ministry and it's amazing. People are drawn to him. And you can't not look at it. When you see a guy walking down the street with a cross, you're going to look at it. Jesus said that we all have a cross to carry. He does it literally as well as spiritually. I'm very, very comfortable on the streets. The Bible says whosoever and whosoever is everybody. Everybody needs Jesus because we're all in the same category. We're, we're either unsaved or we're saved. Unsaved sinner or saved sinner. I was born in Vider, Texas, but I was raised in, in uh, Texas City. That's the name of the city, Texas City. And that was nine miles from Galveston Island, which is where I spent all my summers surfing, 38 miles uh, south of, of the big city, Houston. Tom grew up in a family with nine children. His father worked hard, but the family was poor. He was full-blooded Mexican, so prejudice was pretty uh, big in Texas. and. Even though he never took that personally, I began to take things personally when things happened to him, whether he was fired or, or prejudiced against, and he never would lash out, but I found myself having a real rage about how they were treating you know, my dad. I began to think that that society owed me instead of me owing them. So at, at the age of, uh, in ninth grade, uh, even before then, uh, that's when I began to, to break the law. I was stealing, I was burglarizing, I was what they call rolling drunks, uh, you know, putting knives to drunks and taking their money from them. And so I did that because I wanted to make money. I wanted to have money. And, and funny, the reason I wanted to make this money was to help mom and dad out so that they wouldn't have to have the burden of trying to take care of me. Still that rage was in me and, and eventually you know, it got to me to a point where I began to think about doing things that I wasn't supposed to do and that led up to a bank robbery. Got away with that bank robbery, took off, ended up in Las Vegas, Nevada for a season and, and then went to Monterey, California to go surfing and everything, you know, like I wanted to do. But when you when you when you're robbing, the FBI is after you. Uh, they have all the time in the world to uh, track you down and find you. And, and of course, I thought I was, you know, not never going to be busted. But I ran out of money, so I began to uh, rob people in their homes. He found a home he thought he could rob. Knock on the door. Hey, can I use your phone? My car broke down, and some people are gullible. They they, they let them come in. And when, when that happened, I robbed him. I tied him up just like you see in the movies and stuff like that. And I thought I had tied him up enough and, and stole the stuff and I needed the car, so I stole their car. As I was driving away, I was saying, all right, I'm heading back to you know, uh, San Francisco Bay Area and then back to Las Vegas. But I looked in the rearview mirror and, and guess what I saw? Squad cars with the big old lights blaring and glaring. And as a result, uh, you know, I knew that, that my time was up. Uh, they, they surrounded me and they, you know, do, do what they do good and, and put the handcuffs on me. And after that, of course, that's when jail time and then prison time took place. I'd lay on my iron bunk, you know, the, the bunk at nighttime thinking about my future. What was I gonna do? I, was this really the end of it? I mean, I, I saw no future because, you know, being a bank robber, being an armed robber, I mean, that's something that people don't laugh at. And I really felt that I was at my wit's end. I really felt that I really had nothing to do except to do my number, do my time, get out, and then what? Well, I'd probably have to continue stealing and robbing, and, you know, and, and I didn't want to do that. I wanted to be a free person. Psychologists in prison labeled Tom and other inmates atavists, or genetic throwbacks, meaning they had an extra X chromosome that makes them prone to violence. I couldn't buy that. I didn't think that I was just an atavist, you know, a subhuman. I, I had feelings and I uh, cared about people. I cared about certain inmates in prison. And, and yet I, I still didn't see if there was a future. The group of Christian athletes associated with the Bill Glass Crusaders, they came into the joint and about 400 of us decided that we would attend that event in the gymnasium and we listened to what they had to say. Here were uh, 
Christian athletes who said they were the best in their field, football, basketball, uh, weightlifting, whatever it might be. We'll bring in NFL players, jugglers, NASCAR drivers, whatever. And, and we go to the yard. We, we uh, Nothing wrong with having chapel and those things on prison and jail and juvenile sites, but we go to the yards. Um, these men and women don't have to come to us, but we draw them in with these entertainers. And then they actually will give them a, a short message that will say, hey, God changed the direction in my life. And he wants to change the direction in yours. And how many of you would like a new direction? Just raise your hand. The founder of the organization, Bill Glass, was drafted by the Detroit Lions in 1957 as a defensive end. Played a few years with the Lions and then played with the Cleveland Browns. Toward the end of his football career, he started speaking at evangelist Billy Graham's crusades. And Bill Glass asked him, hey, what do you want me to do? And Billy Graham said, man, get in the game. You can start doing crusades just like I am. We're on the same team. And so, so Bill Glass, uh, 54 years ago, started doing citywide evangelism crusades, just like Billy Graham, all over the world. About four years into doing those citywide crusades, one of his good friends who was on the ministry's board said, Bill, you keep preaching that Jesus says we're to be fishers of men. And he said, the best fishing holes in all of the world are jails and prisons. These men and women are in crisis every day of their life looking for a new direction. He was creative in reaching people who are in the prison who wouldn't be the ones attending the chapel service. So he went to, you know, held events that would draw people in that normally wouldn't, you know, be going, you know, to Bible studies or, or worship services. Football star, Dallas Cowboys star, I believe Roger Staubach coming in and like throwing passes with incarcerated guys and then getting up and offering his testimony or um, Olympic weightlifters coming in and doing weightlifting demonstrations right before, you know, to, to sort of get interest uh, from the people gathered on the prison yard, and then Glass would get up, get up and give like an evangelistic talk. At the end of the crusade, they gave the altar call, and of course, like all inmates, you put on the front. And I told my buddy next to me, his his name Al, my best friend in prison. I said, "Well, let's get out of here." And so we both started walking down the bleachers and got toward the bottom. And then all of a sudden, though, something turned me in the direction of where that altar call was. And it was like, it was like a force. It was like something that just beckoned me, you know, and it wasn't uh, intrusive, it wasn't harsh. It was something, just a, a gentle nudging and yet powerful. And all of a sudden I found myself walking down to the altar. Didn't know what that was, didn't know what to expect, but I went down to the altar, Al followed me, and then we just, you know, stayed there as they began to talk about it. And what happened is I accepted Jesus Christ as my savior into my life, February 9th, 1973. I felt the difference immediately. And something happened to me. I, it, it's like I got hope again. I, it's like a, a brand new lease on life. It's like I was gonna get a second chance, an opportunity. Tom got out of prison in 1975 and got a job quickly. He went to church with one of the prison guards he became friends with. I met Tom in church. Um, he came to church with the prison guard that he met in prison and his wife, and his wife and I were in choir together. So he would sit with them. And then uh, one day I noticed him, so I went and sat nearby. And that was how we met. I went to church, and the church we went to, First Assembly of God at Bakersfield, California, I met a young girl in the choir named Jeanette. And immediately we liked each other. She didn't know anything about me, and of course she was an inquirer, so I figured she was a, uh, you know, a Christian all the way. But for some reason we were attracted to each other. We started talking, and then we started dating. I shared with her what I was and where I came from, and that didn't, that didn't phase her. She decided, yeah, Christ Jesus really did make a change in your life. So we fell in love, and we just decided that, you know what, we need to get married because that was the right thing to do. And on February 14th, 1976, Jeanette and I decided to get married. He was the new guy in church. 
And so I think everybody knew his past uh, up to a point. Um, he says even now I don't know everything that ever happened uh, before he became a Christian. Um, but I knew the fun part was telling my parents. Tom and Jeanette had two daughters and one son. I remember the first time I heard my dad um, in the past was um, in prison. <laughs> um, and I was shocked. Um, I was so surprised just because that was, my dad is a completely kind, good soul. I never, you know, he played sports with us, games, we never, I never expected that. In 1975, Tom was released from prison. In 1975 to 1978, Tom worked for Teen Challenge in Bakersfield as the drug education coordinator and then associate director. From 1978 to 1982, Tom served as the executive director of Teen Challenge San Francisco. From 1982 to 2006, Tom and his wife started Teen Scene in Bakersfield. From 2006 to the present, Tom has been involved in Walk the Cross Ministries. From 2015 to 2020, Tom walked the cross to all 50 states. When Tom was in charge of a group called Teen Scene in Bakersfield, a man came to their recreation center with a big wooden cross. The kids got really got excited about seeing the cross, and he shared a little bit about why he was doing that. I watched that, but I wasn't interested in, in walking across at that time because I was uh, busy with these kids, not only in the schools, but also at our center. I remembered that. In 2006, it's as if God said, now I want you, you've done what I wanted you to do here with these kids, now I want you to take Bill across and take that cross all across California. He gave me the dimensions, 10 feet by 5 feet, of course a 4 by 4 wood, and put a wheel on it and end up 60 pounds. Is that the dimensions of the cross that Jesus carried and was crucified on? Most people who have studied that feel that this was the dimensions. Of course, it went down into the ground probably four feet, so it was probably 14 feet, but he was probably about this high off the ground when he was crucified, mm -hmm. about 10 feet. This is a 60 pound cross. You get used to it. He's pretty strong to be carrying that thing around. <laughs> I lifted up one day. I thought I was gonna get a hernia. Before the my dad goes crosswalking, um, yeah, he's very he's very energized, excited. Um, he's ready to go. He's just he he's just has this look on him that he's just like, okay, I'm happy. I'm ready to go. Let's do it. God told me to do. <laughs> Walked across ministries began 2006. After I built the cross, it, it was in March. The rain had stopped, it had been pouring rain in February, so I couldn't actually walk the cross. But on March the 1st, no rain, so I went downtown Bakersfield with this cross, and I said, well, okay, let's see what happens, Lord. And so I started going to the, the courthouse, to the, to the uh, council members' chambers, went to the police department, hoisted this cross upright, and began to pray loud, because I prayed loud and long. I began to pray loud and long that God would bless these elected officials to do what is right in His sight for the sake of the people living in our city. I walked across, but the most important part is my prayer talk to the Lord for the people that I see, wh whoever it might be. Pushing this cross up, praying on behalf of the men, the women, the children, the families affected by the criminal justice system because of crimes that they are being charged with that they've actually committed and let them see this cross as your plus sign. Nothing negative about the cross, all things positive. One captive plus the cross of Jesus Christ set free. We, we pray outright, we pray uh, long and loud. I pray audibly because I want people to understand I'm praying for them. I want them to know what I'm praying, that I'm not asking God to condemn them or uh, rain down fire and brimstone upon him, but to share forth and send forth his spirit of love so that people will understand how much God actually loves us. For our thin blue line, keep them safe and secure, watch over and protect them. By your mighty name and through your great power. I usually go 10 miles in a circular uh, uh, motion. Uh, crosswalking each day that I do crosswalk. I love talking to gang members. We, we, we need to reach out to those 
who were angry about life. Remember, that was my testimony, how angry I was. Tom met a group of gang members in Bakersfield who asked for prayer they would find jobs so they could leave the gang and street life. One year later, he was walking the cross back down that same street when a man with a baby stroller and a woman walked up to him. And he said, hey, 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 hey. A year ago, you prayed for me. This is my wife. This is my baby. We had a baby. You prayed that I got a job so I could get out of the gang. And guess what? I got a good job. I'm no longer a gangbanger. I'm taking care of my family now. I'm so happy. I'm a Christian now. I accepted Christ as my Savior. One day, Tom was walking at a hard park in Bakersfield when he was stopped by a county sheriff's deputy. He said, hi, I want to tell you something. And he walked up to me. He said, you don't know this, but a couple weeks ago, you walked in our neighborhood, praying for our neighborhood, and my wife saw you from her kitchen window. Now, she was ready to give up on life. She was ready to kill herself. But she saw the cross, and for some reason, that cross, which represents Jesus Christ, that cross made an impression on her, and she immediately called me and said, hey, I'm no longer depressed. I'm no longer overwhelmed by anything. I, I, I saw this guy with a big old cross, and, and God gave me living hope now, so I'm, I'm gonna live. I'm not gonna have to kill myself. I feel really good. And this deputy sheriff was crying. I started crying. People can identify with his, his past struggles before Christ. And he's uniquely equipped to speak on their level uh, because of what he's experienced himself. And so, you know, not just anybody could do what he does. Hello, how you doing, huh? Hey, God bless you. Have a blessed day. Jesus loves you. As each year passed by, God began to put on my heart to go to different cities in California. So I began to go to Southern California cities. Hollywood, California was perhaps my third or fourth destination. Had a great great, great experience of people responding to the message of the cross, which is about Jesus Christ, of course, in Hollywood, California. And I said, wow, this is great. Other cities will do this too. So in the end, so far, 160 California cities we've been able to travel to, hoist this cross up, pray at the city halls, pray at the government building, pray at the police stations, asking God to start great revival in the midst of all the people living in these cities. Surround us, city, your grace and mercy. Tom has gone to the Hearing Aids Today store in Bakersfield for years to pray with the owner, Rick Cheshire. When I found out that, you know, he was really in need of funding, I, I, was, I was surprised and I was happy to be a part of that. Um, and then later on, as that progressed, I found out about his desire to walk the cross around the entire nation but at that time he had this little blue truck and every time he pulled up to the office because he'd always come and pray with me he's been such an amazing blessing in my life but he'd pull up in that little truck and I was always like gosh I wish he had a better truck he came in one day and he brought in a paper and it said and it said crosswalking the, the 50 states and he had made this this flyer and I asked him I said how are you going to be able to do that in that that little blue truck and he said I don't know if it can do it but God put it on my heart to walk the cross around every every city and every every capital in our country. Rick started praying for a truck for Tom. He called car dealerships and asked if they could sell a truck at cost. He wasn't finding any takers. He talked to a man in his church who owned a used car dealership. Is there a way that we can do this you know and I'm thinking okay this has got to be the guy you know he goes to my church and He's like, I really don't know how, you know, I can make that work. And, and he looked out the window and he goes, well, what about your truck? And I was like, wait, what? You know, because I had, I had paid that truck off and I was thinking, you know, I'm finally being fiscally responsible and thank you, Lord. And I, well, I, I would literally get in that truck every day and just thank the Lord that I had a truck that was paid off, that I was fiscally responsible because cars had been a weakness of mine before. I never paid off a car before I'd buy the next one. Um, and the guy, I said, well, that truck's too, you know, it's a short bed. That could never carry a cross. And he said, well, okay, um, what about a, what about a um, bed extender? And I was like, what? And so I left there and I was thinking, trying to shake it off. Like that's, you know, the guy's not going to help me. So I got a little upset, like thinking, well, this guy's a Christian. He's supposed to help me. 
And as I'm driving off, the Lord just said in my head, and I just, it was so loud, and all of a sudden, because I didn't want to hear him say it, but I heard bed or bed extender. And I was like, no way. And so I was like, that can't be possible. I pull over and I Google bed extender, like this isn't, there's not gonna be a bed extender that worked, and it's the perfect bed extender. And so right then I was like, oh my gosh, I have, <laughs> I have to, the Lord just showed me that that was the truck. And I was like, I have to go home and tell my wife this car truck that we paid off that we have to give it <laughs> to a guy, to Tom Alexander who's walking the cross around the, the entire nation. I remember coming home and he's like, hey, my friend just gave me a truck. And I was like, wait, what? Um, it always amazes me when I hear people, they just, I don't know, they do what the Lord say and say, hey, give Tom a truck. And to see my dad's face, just, he's just sh like, so happy. When he first said he was going to do this, I'm like, uh, how are we going to get the money for this? And I think one of the things he's always said was, if it's God's will, it's God's bill. And so um, I didn't quite trust all of that um, in the beginning, but as time went by and we didn't get lost and the car didn't break down and there was always room in the inn wherever we stopped, um, I realized that, you know, God really was in it. And so it got easier for me. Every year he'd pick maybe nine states that we would do a, a bunch together. Um, but the minute we got home, he was already planning the next one again. I'm like, we just got home. We ran out of money. What are you talking about? So, but it was always there, right when God wanted us to go somewhere. I didn't expect um, there to be really moments at gas stations. I thought it would always be while Tom had the cross on his back that he would, you know, meet with people and really have what he calls church on the street. But so many people would come up and they'd want to touch the cross and they'd want their picture taken with it. And they'd say, you know, after seeing this, after praying with you, after talking with you, I'm going to go back and I'm going to get back involved in Sunday school at my church. I'm going to maybe start that small group. I've never been out of California um, except for one trip for work before I got married. But going to every state and, and just talking to regular people, the waitresses in restaurants, um, like I said, at the gas stations, at grocery stores, uh, most of the time Tom walked the streets by himself. Sometimes I came along to document it, so I got to listen to the people that would talk to him. Um, and just, you know, everybody's the same. You think of people being different in different states, but everybody is the same and has the same hurts, or in some cases, um, I'm surprised at how many people um, respect the cross and how a lot of people had to touch it, had to come up. How many times Tom said, people said I needed to see the cross today. That happened in all 50 states. And that just shows just how much we're hurting in America and, and needing hope and needing, well, needing the Lord. When it came time to go to Hawaii, Tom flew to Honolulu only with the wheel for the cross. When he got there, a leader with YWAM, Youth with a Mission, picked him up, took him to a Home Depot, and built a cross with him. Took in his group, the YWAMers, to Honolulu, right there, uh, on Waikiki Beach, and we began to share the gospel. And they put the cross on their shoulders and they took off. And they started walking and, and lifting it up and praying and stopping. And they said, they told me this later, wow, it's very easy because people actually come up to you. You don't have to go after them. They actually come up to you and, and they wonder what's going on with the cross or they have prayer needs because they know what the cross is about. Tom took a wheel with him to the capital of Alaska, Juneau, but this time he had no local contacts. He went to a Home Depot there. I walked to the uh, commercial uh, uh, branch of Home Depot and I said, hey, I'm from Bakersfield, California, showed her my card and I come here to pray for not only uh, Juneau, but all of Alaska, but I need, I'm a crosswalker, and I need to construct a cross. Can I construct a cross in your commercial area? She looked at my car, she looked at me, and she said, sure. 
Just like that. Two Home Depot employees heard about what Tom was doing and asked if they could help him construct the cross. I paid for the wood and then I said, well, okay, God, it's seven miles to my motel room. I, I can walk it, but I've been working on this thing all day. I'm tired. He said, well, just go on outside. So I said bye to everybody. And the, and the moment I went outside, the door opened. Lo and behold, a cab pulled up. And it was a, a station, it was, I'm sorry, it was a van cab, big enough to hold this cross. So I said, wow, look at that. She stopped. And the guy was inside that, inside that, uh, and the guy was inside that van. And I looked at him, and something familiar about him. Earlier in the morning, 7.30, I walked outside my motel room waiting for the cab, and I noticed a young man standing oh, 20 feet away from me, and he looked at me and smiled, I looked at him and smiled, and beautiful day today in Juno. And, uh, and he said, yes, it sure is. Have a great day. The, the usual greetings that we do. And as I was waiting for my cab, he'd look at me, I'd look at him, another, not another word. Cab came, picked me up, and of course, constructed that cross, went outside, there was that cab. I looked in that passenger side, and lo and behold, it was him. I recognized him. I said, well, what? The cab driver, her name is Janetta, she got out, and she said, we'll put your cross in the back, of, but I got, I got to get this fare from this young man right here. And so she did, and, and uh, I looked at him. I said, hey, weren't you downtown at, by the motel this morning? He said, yeah. I said, well, what, what do you mean? Why, why are you here? And his answer was this, because God loves his children. And I said, okay. I looked at Janetta, she looked at me, and she said this first. You know, that's an angel, right? And he was walking away. And we turned to look, and guess what? Nobody there. I met a group of kids there later on, Campus Crusade for Christ. They call themselves CRU now, C-R-U. And, and they were on the, the, the sea walk, which is where all the cruise ships were. Cruise ships hold 10,000 people, and they were all d disembarking that day, and I'm walking across down there. So, you know, 30,000 people got to see the cross. I got to talk to a lot of people. They talk different languages because they're from other countries, but they understand the universal message of the cross. A group of young kids came up to me. And they said, hey, we were, we were told you were going to be here today because one of the workers uh, at Home Depot was also part of their crew, and he said, look, uh, we're gonna have a group of kids down there uh, tomorrow, and maybe they'll see you, and sure enough, they did. So they all came, and they got to walk the cross and hold the cross, and, and it really, really touched their lives that they got to do that, and how people responded to that on that, that sea walk. Tom started to take the cross to every state capital. In 2020, he had just nine left, the northeastern states. People will say, well, you won't be able to go because they're not gonna let you in motels and they're not gonna let you in the restaurants and they're not gonna let you do this or that. But God, some reason said, I want you to go. So everywhere we went, all of the last nine st states, the door was always open for us to get that motel room, to, to eat that restaurant food, but more than anything else, to hoist this cross up in these cities and the state capitals and pray for people and share with people that Jesus Christ is greater than COVID. In fact, he's greater than anything. And all but one state let us into their motels. Vermont was the only state that would not let us stay in the motel because California was on a list of 33 states that were for, forbidden to go into Vermont. So we ended up going into a, a, a city one hour away in New Hampshire. We stayed the night and then we actually prayed, hoisted across and prayed at the state capitals. And August 21st, 2020, Maine, Augusta, Maine, made it state number 50. If there's a tragedy that occurs, Within our community, Tom is one of the first people to show up and start praying. In the last year, I've dealt with a, a pretty serious illness for myself, and Tom has 
constantly encouraged me, called me, texted me, and uh, just checking on me, but most importantly has just been a prayer warrior for me uh, for the last year, and I believe it's definitely made a difference. In our country, there is so much division. There are great concerns also. We face great challenges, and it's so wonderful to have Tom there praying for our community, praying for our state, praying for our nation. I think the, the biggest thing is people go, why is he doing that? Okay, you believe in God, but you know, I believe in God too, but I don't carry a big cross around. So <laughs> it's, 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 it's that object lesson. You can't not look at it. I'm 75 years of age. God has so far given me good health. I expect, I hope, and I want to carry this cross until at least I'm 85. I really feel that there's so much more work to do. And all you have to do is look out and see that the fields are ripe in the harvest. So I hope for another decade to walk this cross, as we say, to the wheels fall off. These next few years, and again, we hope it's another decade, we want to take this cross to the major cities of America, the biggest cities of America, right into the heart of these cities, into the inner cities, into the, wherever the, the need is, is, is necessary, Push this cross up and pray for great awakening and great revival. So at least for now, Tom will keep praying and walking the cross. In the months ahead, the weeks ahead, the days ahead, decision making concerning our city, that they make righteous decisions, righteous judgments, and righteous decrees so that this city continues to experience prosperity, protection, and certainly peace from you, Lord. We pray together, I ask you to this, and I ask you for this, Lord, Christ Jesus' name, amen.